All right, it's going to be a really interesting teaching, a lot of deep stuff. I also want to mention this, is that this teaching is something that I learned from other Bible believers. That is very important to understand. Not all of this is from yours truly. I got this from other Bible believers. So that's the reason why I keep urging people who watch us online to please attend a Bible-believing church. Amen. You'd be amazed how many Bible-believing preachers out there who don't get as much attention as I do of the incredible knowledge that they know. And when I talk to these other Bible-believing preachers, I mean, it's just fascinating. I learn from them as well. So we rub off on each other. Iron sharpeneth iron. Amen. So that's the reason why I'm able to give this teaching to you because it, not all of it is from me. A lot of you know that I came from uh, Dr. Ruckman's school. So all this knowledge is just practically given to me. There are stuff that I do build upon it my own, but to be quite honest, it's more that I've accumulated from other Bible believers. So that's the blessing of being a Bible-believing Christian and go attend a Bible-believing church. Okay, so Genesis 10. Let's finish it because we didn't finish those verses. And then the one that you're anticipating waiting for, the Tower of Babel. What were they trying to do? I'm going to tell you they were trying to do something... Very phenomenal, very incredible. One that could have extinguished life on earth, actually. Wow. It is dangerous than any atomic bomb or weapon that could have wiped out humanity, what they were building. So I'm going to teach you why that's the case, and it's extremely fascinating. But let's wrap up Genesis 10 with Shem's descendants, okay? So verse 31, these are the sons of Shem. After their families, after their tongues, in their lands, after their nations. So that's self explanatory. All the names from verses 21 through 30 are the sons of Shem. And they are named after their own family, after their own languages are also given. And in their own land that they dwelled in, they dwelt upon, and then also their own nation their own culture that they created. Now remember, this is verse by verse, literally word for word explanation Bible study. The reason why I do that is so because there are so many people who say the King James Bible is hard to understand, but it's actually not. So that's why this class is designed to explain every single word. And that way you can understand literally every single word. And then once you have a common sense gist of the language of the King James Bible, then give it about a year or two, you're going to go, wait, it's actually very easy to understand. It's like students who start out reading legal documents. At the beginning, it's conundrum, hard to understand. But once you get a gist of its language, its system, how it's designed, then you can read it incredibly fast once you get the common sense gist of it. That's how the Bible is designed too. You might say, why is it designed that way? Because it's designed for you to grow in. Amen. The Word of God is designed for you to grow. Uh, salvate, uh, there are false doctrines that teach about the passage in Peter that you may grow up in your salvation. No, it's growing up in the Word. People want to work hard for their salvation, but with the Word of God, I guess they just want to be lazy and read an easier language. Oh. Salvation should be something very easy, all done by the work of Jesus Christ. But the Word of God is something that you have to work hard for and study. Uh, by the way, the modern Bibles drop the word study in the, in the Word of God in Timothy. It says, study to show thyself approved unto God, rightly dividing the Word of truth. They get rid of the word study. All right, now let's uh, get onward, okay? That way I can get on to the interesting teaching. Verse 32, these are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. Again, that's self-explanatory. Uh, 32 is summarizing all the people's names here. From the three main sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, they, those are all the families from those three sons of Noah. And they are named after their generation, in their nationality, their nation that they abided in. And by these, okay, names, people given, their territories, 
the nations were divided in the earth. So remember, everything was divided. That was God's intention and purpose. I explained that very, so many times in Genesis 10. His uh, purpose was for all of them to spread out and to divide, not to integrate. And you're going to know why at Genesis chapter 11 very soon. So he wanted them to scatter. Divided in the earth after the flood. So this was after the flood and they were in the earth. They were all divided. Now Genesis 11 will explain before they were all divided and scattered, they were integrated. Okay, let's go back. If we were to remember going step by step from the beginning, it went with uh, Noah after that incident with his drunkenness. So when Noah was uh, drunken, uh, Noah drunk, let's do that way, that'll be simpler. Okay. When Noah was drunk, that incident, then we're wondering what happened after that. Well, obviously, the sons produced children, right? Once they produced children, then the Bible talks about, at Genesis 10, they were divided in their nations. So divided nations. But what was going on between here? That's where we want to know, right? What happened in between here? A lot of very interesting stuff. So what we do know is if the sons produced children and they didn't scatter yet because the Tower of Babel was, still, uh, was being built, then they were all together. So then they were all together. And what happened at verse 1? And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. So the entire earth, which Noah's children were spreading out, when Shem, Ham, and Japheth produced children, they were with their dads, and then they had grandchildren. Grandchildren stuck along with them. And then they were uh, intermarrying and then producing more children. And they, during that whole time, the whole earth, obviously, because they were one big family together, they were able to talk to each other. So they were one language and one speech. They can communicate well with each other. They were together. Verse 2, and it came to pass. So that's usually the wording in your King James Bible saying what happened later on, right? So, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Okay, so sometime later when they were journeying from the east, so they were journeying. Now, this is very important about Noah's family. When Noah was drunk, remember, uh, the ark resided where? In Ararat, right? So if it was on Mount Ararat, and then Mount Ararat, when you look at your maps, that's in Turkey, then you're like, then how do you get Babel and Babylon, right? So Babel, Babylon, is located, they said right here, Shinar at verse 2. Now if you, rec if you recall, at chapter 10, verse 10, 10, verse 10, if you recall, Shinar is a location where Babel and Babylon is close by or located, all right? So how do you get from Turkey all the way there? Verse 2 is a clue. They were migrating. They were journeying. It's an irrefutable fact that if you study genetics and history, genealogy, they were migrating. People always migrate from one territory to another territory, especially when they're growing bigger. However, this group of people, they were sticking together at verse 4. Verse 4, they said, lest we be scattered abroad upon uh, the face of the whole earth. So they were trying to stick together. But even though they were migrating, they were trying to stick together. They weren't like scattering out. So that's important to understand. So they were trying to stick together, and as they were migrating together, they were journeying from the east, it says. So then how do you get from Turkey all the way to Babylon? If you look at the map, what's very possible is this. From uh, Turkey, 
they could have went a little bit toward us, uh, uh, I think toward the south or wherever. But if you look at that map, you'll see Persia and India, okay? When, which is basically Iran. So then when you look over there at Iran, which Dr. Ruckman argues would be uh, Persia, India, that they came from the east. And I tend toward to go that direction. But I don't say it's far as India. I would say up to Persia if we're going to try to be close to Babel and Babylon. Because you know what's next to Iran or close by? It's Iraq, which is uh, modern-day Babylon. So if the children of Israel were going that way, then that would make sense. They were migrating from Turkey, which is Mount Ararat. Noah could have moved down toward Iran. And then as his children were growing bigger, then they were just traveling more and more and more and more. And then they moved to Iraq. And then God pushed Abraham further that way. He pushed him further uh, west. Pushed him further west where you find Israel. If you look at your map, that's how it's designed. So that's where it turned out to be. They lived there. They dwelt there in the land of Shinar at verse 2. Verse 3, and they said one to another, so they're talking to each other, go to. So that English phrase you can tell is similar with come on, go, right? Come, see that? Go to, come on. So that's the idea. Come on, let's build us a tower. That's the idea. So that's the old English expression, go to. Go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. And so they want to make brick and then burn them very thoroughly, make sure that they have this brick set up so why They can build this tower, so it has to be strong. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. So then brick was their stone to build on top of each other. Slime was their mortar. Now notice right here, this is man-made. Uh, in Noah's Ark, it's mostly natural resources, mostly if not completely natural resources, God's own creation, God's own materials. But over here, it's man-made material, Genesis 11.3. Noah's Ark was most, mostly God-made materials. Now think about this. First clue is given right here. Where did they learn that from? Where did they learn that from? If you believe that the pyramids in Egypt was somehow sons of God built, then maybe, maybe, these inhabitants, because wouldn't you as children be fascinated too? I mean, they didn't have movie theaters back then. What they had was a story from their parents. We, uh, the Lord drowned out with the worldwide flood. Why'd that happen, Dad? Because there was a lot of wickedness going on. What wickedness? There were fallen beings out from the universe who came down amongst humans, and the kids were like, ooh. You know, that's what onliners are fascinated with, yeah. right? The dark stuff, the evil stuff, sadly. More than the Word of God, sadly. More than, you know, the nine fruits of the Holy Spirit and your soul-winning verses. Sadly, it's that dark stuff, right? Like, ooh, the watchers and the sons of God, what were they doing? And, and then th dad's like, well, you know, there was just wicked stuff. They were intermingling with God knows what over there. What, really? You know, and then the kids are like talking to each other, right? Like, did you hear what my dad said? Well, my dad told me this. And what, there were pyramids back then? How'd they build it? Well, the fathers have the antediluvian knowledge. In other words, they have the timeline of their ancestors during Noah's flood. They had the knowledge at that time. So then, some of the parents, I mean, parents can be backslidden. They're not spiritual people too, right? And sometimes parents who are not spiritual, they'll tell some worldly stuff to their children. Oh, don't act all holy, some of you parents. I, you know you're just as hypocritical and rotten coming to church today. Your children learn some stuff, and trust me, it's not just from the wickedness of the world. They learn it from their parents. 
So then the children learn something from their parents. And the parents are like, ah, maybe I shouldn't say this. Oh, come on, Dad, just tell me. It's not like I'm going to build a pyramid or a tower that would reach to heaven. Come on, Dad, why don't you tell me? And then 20 years later, there goes your kid building a tower that reaches to heaven. You know what I mean? Oh, come on, Dad, Mom. It's not like I'm going to do this sin like, tw like later on. Just tell me. And guess what? Ten years later, you catch them doing it. Yeah, I'm preaching at the teenagers. Teenagers, you're all wicked in human nature, man. Gullible, gullible humans, man. So then the children, they're learning that stuff, and then they talk to each other, right? They do their hangouts as teens, you know, going past their curfew late at night and talking about, you know, all the, yeah, you know what I learned from my dad? Yeah, I learned this and that. And why don't we experiment that? So then they start to experiment late at night, you know, Hey, don't, uh, you know, I'm telling the truth. Human nature never changed, you know. Yeah, let's experiment, you know. Let, let me try that. Hey, give me a shot, you know, something like that. So, you know, that's what they must have done. So then all of a sudden, hey, come on, go to, let's build us a tower that reach to heaven, you know. They weren't like, I don't know how to do this. No, I'm too pure and innocent. No, no, they were corrupted ever since birth. You just sin just takes little by little by little and you learn garbage one, garbage two, and then your child says some kind of cuss word and you go, where'd you learn that from? Okay, anyways. So then they had some sons of God knowledge, okay? But let's put that as a possibility for now. Possibility for now is that they had this knowledge about the sons of God. Now that's very important to understand verse 3. If this possibility is true, then you got to think about this. If this possibility is true, then imagine, if you recall Genesis 6, these sons of God, they had this knowledge where you can interact with the heavenlies. So then these people, when they were building this tower, they were doing something else then maybe. They're probably doing where they can interact with the heavenlies up there. But let's think about that. That's what they were trying to do. We can tell, right? At verse 4, they were, whose top may reach unto heaven. See that? So let's read verse 4, all of it. And they said, go to. So come on, they said. Let us build us a city and a tower. So they want to build a city and then a tower. If they're going to build a city, that means they want to stay. They, want, they don't want to scatter, right? They want to stay. And then they want a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. See, I told you so. They want to build a top that's going to uh, reach heaven, interact with the heavenlies. And let us make us a name. So they want to create themselves a name. We'll explain that one a little later. That's going to be eye-opening. Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the old whole earth. Lest they scatter and spread out. They want to stay. <coughs> Now, you get these uh, atheists or some of these people who are very ignorant of Scripture. They don't know much. They would say, well, how can you build a tower that will reach to heaven? That's so stupid. Well, the thing is this. Some people wonder, maybe uh, they were just stupid and foolish trying to build something that will reach to heaven when it's impossible and when they can't. That might be true, but the question is verse 5. The question at verse 5 is, why would the Lord at verse 5, 6, and 7 stop them? Why couldn't he just leave them be because, and then let them suffocate up in the atmosphere and then go higher and higher and make, the, make a fool out of themselves? God could have just left it alone unless the Lord saw this was something that was very evil right? There's no doubt it was because of something evil, because of verse uh, 6, it says, now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Nothing's going to stop them, God says. So not even the high elevation of the air or something like that is going to stop them. God knows their imagination is going to carry into something that's very, very evil. That's the same thing like Genesis 6, right? Their imagination was very evil. So God had to drown it with the worldwide flood. So there was something there that God had to stop. 
So I don't think it's something where they, uh, it was a fantastical thing. I think that it was a real deal. I think that they were trying to get up to heaven itself, trying to interact with the heavenlies. But you might say, how is that the case? It's going to be very eye-opening once you look at the scriptures. How does God build his millennium? And that's God on the earth. That's interacting with the heavenlies, where we say kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven is combined, if you learn dispensationalism. But that's a separate topic. Go to Zephaniah 3 and Micah 4. Zephaniah 3. And then we'll look at Micah chapter 4. This is very fascinating stuff. Micah 4 and Zephaniah 3. Now remember, the Tower of Babel, the people were, were all of one language, right? Is that correct? Right. All right. When God builds up his millennial kingdom... And basically, that's God inter contacting man, right? That's the heavenlies interacting with the world, right? Guess what? God knows that in order for the heavenlies to contact with the world, for God to be in contact with man, he's going to have to build his residency, his worship center, on a very high altitude... And that all the people have to be in one language to go up there. Look at Zephaniah 3. Zephaniah chapter 3. Uh, notice right here. Let's see. Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 9. For then... Will I turn to the people? So this is the millennium. At the millennium, what is God going to do when he lives on the earth? I'll turn to the people a what? Pure language. That's strange. Why does God want one pure language at the millennium? Why? Because there is one language that you need to talk to to communicate with God. It's interacting with the gods or God. So one language, check, right? So in order for mankind, so if you look at this drawing, in order for mankind to interact with God, you need one language, right? Check. Second thing, you need to come, you need to create a name. What did Genesis 11 said? Let us make us a name. Why? What did that mean? Oh, they knew what it meant. God knows what it meant. If you didn't know what it meant, I'll tell you what God thinks what it means. Look at verse 9. That they may all, see, with one world, one language, call upon the name of the Lord. See that? It has to do with uh, contacting deity when you create a name. Or worshiping. To serve him with one consent. There is one consent over here. And then Genesis chapter 11, they were all in one consent, right? They were in agreement. Go to, let us build. Micah, go to Micah. Four. Look at this. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention this part of Zephaniah 3, but... If you look at Zephaniah chapter 3 and then verse uh, 11, it's done at his holy mountain, high place. That's where they worship him. It's at a high elevation. If you look at mountains and pyramids, they have a similar shape. If you look at the Tower of Babel and the pyramid, it all comes to some kind of similar shape. They're all trying to what? Go up. There's something there. There's something there. This is not just a, a coincidence or trying to, connect, trying to connect dots. No, this is something that's pretty realistic in Scripture. If you just read the Scripture and take it literally, there's, there's a pattern. Now look at Micah 4, verse 1. 
But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord, see, God establishes his kingdom on top of a very high mountain. And it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall what? Flow unto it. All come together. Look at verse 2. And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach of us his way. See that? But look at verse 5. This is interesting. For all people will walk everyone in the name of of his God. See that? People have a history of doing that, but God says, no, when I build my mountain, when people come to worship me, they're not making a name for their God. It's for what? Me, he says. Keep reading. It says, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. This high elevation has to do with the making a name, contacting God's. Think about it. It's undoubtable in history, too. Uh, Korea's ancient religion was shamanism. But why Buddhism built temples on mountains, and you would wonder why. Why couldn't you do it at a lower elevation? Why on top of a mountain? Is because of history. Shamanism believed the biggest spirits inhabited high places, mountains. So then that's why Buddhism easily seeped, seeped in, and they built their temples on the mountains. Everyone has an infatuation with God somehow on high elevation, mountains. Think about your Old Testament. They build God's images on where? High places, mountains. There's all something connected here. That's an in, To make contacts with the gods is on a high elevation. So yes, I believe that what they were trying to do, they were trying to contact the gods. But how can you do that when you got uh, the atmosphere where you got only get so much room to breathe and you're going to pop and then you got the, what, light years and light years of the universe out there so, and then you got that hard sea of glass. So how are you going to do that? There's no way. But it seemed like it was possible for them, which is why God had to stop them. Yeah. So then what is going on right here? Well, let's establish one by one. First establishment is, there's no doubt, they knew what they were doing. They knew. Why? Because this is similar to what God's going to do in the future. So they knew what they were doing. It's to contact God, okay? Or gods. We can agree with that much so far, right? We looked at the scripture. It has to do with contacting God or gods. There's no doubt about that with these check marks as well, right? All right, that much we agree. Now the question is, all right, I understand all this is to contact God. They knew about that. But how? How do you do that by building a tower? Very interesting stuff. Go to the book of Revelation 4 and Ezekiel 1. Revelation 4 and Ezekiel 1. So this... Some Bible believers adhere to this one. It's because they knew that there was some kind of door or portal up in the skies, in the clouds over there. In the sky and the clouds, there was some kind of door or opening or portal, and they were going to get up there and access it. And this portal will immediately, if you look at this drawing right here, notice that there's a door over here right in the clouds in this heaven. All right? So remember, there are three heavens in your Bible, which you know. The first heaven is the clouds. And then you got the second heaven right here, which is space. And then you got the third heaven right here, which is above. Okay? Well, let me draw these arrows here. That way people can see. So these are the three heavens. So there are three of them. Now, what they're trying to do is by accessing this portal in this heaven, then it'll automatically enter inside this heaven. That's the idea. You might say, is that the case? Well, let's establish things one by one. First of all, it's so interesting, Ezekiel 1, the wording here. Look what Ezekiel saw. 
This is very, very strange. Ezekiel chapter 1. Notice in verse 4, And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. And out of the mist thereof as the color of amber, out of the mist of the, of the fire, and out of the mist thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. So there are four living creatures that Ezekiel saw coming from above, right? Notice it says like uh, whirlwind and cloud, right? At verse 4 out of the north. So that's obviously he looked up here, this heaven, the sky. And then there were four creatures that came out. We can agree with that so far, right? If we agree with that so far, look what the Bible says. Above the head of these four living creatures. Look what's above their head. If you read verse 22, And the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature, see, it's above their heads. They're looking toward the firmament. Was as the color of the terrible Christian crystal stretched forth above their heads, over their heads above. And under the firmament, under this firmament, were their wings straight, the four living creatures. So look at this. Under this firmament is the four living creatures. Above the four living creatures is a firmament that's like terrible crystal. You know what that is. Look at this one right here. That's that sea of glass. Can we agree with that? Look at Revelation 4 now, Revelation 4. We looked at this verse so many times throughout our Genesis study. So let me just say, that, read it quickly at Revelation chapter 4 and verse 6. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. See that? That matches with Ezekiel 1. Terrible crystal above the four creatures, right? Guess who's there? Four creatures at verse 6. And round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. See that? Matches. Matches. Okay, go back to Ezekiel 1. Look at right here, verse 24. And when they went, I heard the noise of their wings like the noise of great waters as the voice of the Almighty. Okay, so there's waters over there. Look at... Uh, Verse 26, And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. That is Revelation 4, no doubt. The throne is up there with God sitting on it. That's what Ezekiel saw. But remember this, Ezekiel... Now let's draw... Now let's draw this. Uh, okay. So then this human being who is down here, he is looking up here, right? Right? When he looks at here, four living creatures come out of here, right? Can we agree with that so far, Ezekiel 1? But then above these four living creatures' head was what? This. That's strange. So then you skip this part over here. That's very strange. So why is it all of a sudden, let's put four creatures here, all right? So above these four creatures, they come out of here. We can agree with that much. They come out of here. Coming out of here, all of a sudden above their head is what? This. You just skip ahead over here. What's going on? Unless they, he was looking through here and it jumped to here. Let me repeat that again. Unless Ezekiel was looking at the four living cherubs coming out of here, right? But then, if this is a door and a portal, it just jumps up to here. You might say, is that true? Look at uh, verse 28. As the appearance of the bow... That is in the cloud in the day of rain. So was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Look at that. Ezekiel, when he's looking, he's looking what? It's like when I'm looking over here, the cloud 
and rainbow, what? He's seeing God at the same time up here in heaven. That's what he said. That would make sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, look at Revelation 4 again. This would make sense. Look at Revelation 4 again. Verse 1. After this, I looked and behold a what? Door was opened in heaven. John was looking at a door over here, right? There's a door. There's no doubt about it. But look at the wording here. Uh, and the first voice which I heard was as if it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And what? Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. And one sat on the throne. Look at that. It would make sense. There's a door over here, just like this drawing shows. And then immediate what? Suddenly, not all this, but just a throne. That shows it looks like a portal. Portal opening up. But if that's not enough, let me show you a little bit more. Go to Job 36. Job 36. What's the clue here? The clue is this. Ezekiel said when he was looking at the cloud, right? Right, cloud? When he's looking at the cloud, all of a sudden from this cloud, it just jumps to here. You know what I'm telling you? What I'm telling you is this, this cloud or one of these cloud is somehow, maybe scientifically or spiritually, I don't know, but this cloud, when you go through this mist, all of a sudden, whew, you pop into heaven. That's what this cloud does. You ever, that's why these people, what do they do with disappearing acts? They do cloud. All, you, you see some of these movies, these sceneries, all of a sudden you're going through a cloud and all of a sudden through this cloud, you jump into something magical. A different realm. Where do they get all these ideas from? Where do they get all these ideas from? Unless some, it's something from the Bible a long time ago. But if you don't believe me, look at Job 36. This one's very interesting wording. Verse 28, uh, verse 27. For he make it small the drops of water. They pour down rain according to the vapor thereof which the clouds do drop and distill upon man abundantly. Okay, can we agree with that so much that it's talking about this cloud right here, right? Can we agree with that? Okay, it's talking about this type of cloud. But look at the wording here. This is so interesting. Keep reading. Also, can any understand the spreadings of the clouds? So God is spreading these clouds for something. He's spreading them here and here and here. What? To do something. He put a spread. All right? Keep reading. From verse 29 of Job 36. Also, can any understand the spreadings of the cloud or the noise of his what? God calls it tabernacle. For some weird reason, this spreading of the cloud is considered his tabernacle. Wait, there's something weird here. Why is it that from this cloud that spreads, all of a sudden you say the tabernacle's right above it. Because if you go up, you know that's not the case. Um, the cloud is covering something. Yep. Keep reading. Keep reading. Behold, he spreadeth his light upon it. All right, so this is talking about the clouds at verse 29, right? He spreadeth his light upon it, right? The light comes out of the clouds. Can we agree with that? All right, so God's light comes out of the clouds. How do you do that unless it jumps through here? But this is way more wild. The cloud what? And covereth the cloud what? The what? Bottom of the sea. No, that don't make, what, what? No, not this sea. There's no cloud covering it. Which sea? Which sea? That makes way more sense. Which part of the sea? Bottom. Is that what it said? Bottom. What's going on is this. This would make sense. Uh, how, did, how can Leviathan th swim through this frozen sea of glass unless, scientifically speaking, 
when you go further, further out to the edge of the universe, it gets colder and colder. And then as you get colder and colder, they claim there's a huge body of water, which is strange. And then is it, isn't it scientific that the least amount of water would be something that's vapor or cloudy? Then you get into something more solid like water and then more solid like frozen. That's what's going on right here. That's why you see these clouds over here too. It's the bottom of the sea. But this is connected to this like a portal. Boom. Like that. So then, when God comes down, if you don't believe me, look at 1 Thessalonians 4. This is even stronger. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4. It's so strange what the Bible says here. It didn't make sense unless you, unless you understand this teaching. Verse 17. This is a rapture, right? 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. This is a rapture. Look at this. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together, rapture, with them in the where? Clouds. Clouds. We go up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. But this is the hard part. Keep reading. And so shall we what? Ever be with the Lord. What? Forever with God up in the clouds? This don't make sense. Unless this is transforming to up here. That's why I believe that, yeah, there's some kind of portal right yeah. here. There's some interacting. That's why it makes sense, Revelation 4, the wording. When a door opens up in the heaven, John saw the sky, immediately what? He, he's up in heaven. That would make a lot of sense. But here's something else that's interesting. Go to Acts 1. This shows the portal. All right, look at Acts 1. And by the way... This is something, I mean, I'm even covering some things that were scientifically covered too. Because Einstein, through his theory of black holes, what did he try to teach? He tried to teach that it may have been possible that these black holes, which is something that light cannot even go through, that if you go through it, you might reach a different dimension or different world. That's why they, uh, movies came out with that one as well trying to go by Einstein's theory. But the scientists can't understand that one. And they say, you know, uh, it's not proven yet. Why? Because they can't do it. But guess who had the knowledge to do it? Primitive, ancient people. Why? Because these scientists, they're too naturalistic and atheist. These people, they were religious. What's more dangerous? Religion can be more dangerous than science and natural workings. Atheists do have a point. Religion can be more dangerous. These guys were demon-possessed. They were doing something that caused God to put a stop to it. If it was just like the natural scientists, like, we're trying to still discover the black hole and use our telescopes, God's like, <laughs> yeah, you got a long ways to go. Yeah, and he's laughing. But then he starts to pay attention when CERN says, you know, uh, and Giordi Rose and those people talk about, you know, let's call them demons or devils. And there's something spiritual. And then God's like, okay, you got my attention now. Yeah, yeah. And then God's like, I think I got to make the clock a little bit faster for the rapture. That's why you see all these crazy things happening. Why? They're opening up to the spiritual realm now, the scientists. But back then during Voltaire and those guys, God was just laughing, his, yeah. laughing from his throne. They're like, there is no God. Nietzsche, God is dead, and God's like, ha ha, okay, whatever, you know, you're not a threat to me, you know. But then when these guys are saying, no, there's some spiritual gods, and let's contact him or them, and then God's like, okay. All right, look at Acts 1. This is very interesting. Look at Acts 1 and verse 9. This is a, this is a portal, uh, like, uh, time, like all of a sudden, jump, boom, transport. Verse 9. Jesus, right, when he goes up, and when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up and a what? Cloud. cloud. That's when Jesus went up, cloud received him, what? Out of their sight. Look at that. All of a sudden, I mean, because if you look up, you know, you could see the sun, moon, and all that, but then this cloud, what did it do? All of a sudden, it just took, made Jesus disappear. Wow, how about that? So, and then boop, like that. 
That's the same thing with us at the rapture too. All right, go back. Go back. That's fascinating, isn't it? Fascinating. And of course, Bible study is always boring. Remember that. That's my favorite line. Maybe people should make a meme about that. All right? Bible study is always boring. Remember that. I prefer Hillsong. All right, then. All right, Genesis chapter 11. See, these people, they don't study the scriptures. They don't spend time to delve into his word. And they miss so much gold. No labor. Be a Calvinist, you know, they're totally boring, you know. They allegorize scripture, put it in a historical perspective, and then they're just deader than a doornail, these Calvinists. Be a Bible believer. That's where you get all this interesting stuff. You go deep into the Word. All right. Let's go to Genesis chapter 11. Now, let's look at verse 5. Verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. So... Mankind's children, when they built this, it caused even God to come down. Why? See, they're doing something. So that's why he has to go down. They're, they're like, boom, boom, you know, doing all the construction work, and God's sea of glass is going, what are they doing? So then he has to go through his door and check out what's going on. And they're like, he's like, oh, whoa. That's, that caused him to come down and to see. So he saw their city. He saw their tower that they were building. Verse 6, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do. God's like, uh, Behold. So remember, that means look. All right? So look. Everybody is one together. They all share one language. And notice this they begin to do. That's why they're beginning to build this. What does that language show? God knows about his millennial kingdom. That how they begin to contact God and interact with him is that they all have to come together and be in one language. God knew that. Otherwise, why would he say this they begin to do? What? Building this high elevation, making a name. Why? Because they're all one language. See, God knows. God knew. God knew. You can tell from that wording. Keep reading. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Now that wording is pretty strong right there. God's saying, so nothing, so right now nothing is going to stop them. They're going to keep doing this. See, not even all this is going to stop them. So that's why God says their imagination, right, all imagine right now this world, what they're promoting, the elitists, the globalists, right? Imagination, imagine, imagine, imagine. That's the thing that mankind has that's more dangerous than AI. It's called imagination, creativity. So then God says nothing's going to restrain, stop them from what they're going to conjure up in their minds. So that's why God had to stop them. So that's why I believe, yeah, they were really trying to go up there. They're really trying to contact the gods. They're doing something. Okay. Now here's another clue. If you look at verse 6, the Bible says, uh, the Bible shows this. God had to put a stop to it, one. And number two, it's according to their imagination. Now, let me refresh your memory, which might be very eye-opening to you. This is all based on mankind's imagination, right? All right, now, think, uh, fresh review. Whenever God wanted to intervene or cut off mankind from something, he never did that with the Holocaust. He never intervened and did something during the Inquisition. He never did it during the 400 years of silence with the Jews. He didn't even do it with the Roman soldiers when they crucified his son on a cross. He never sent fire down from heaven and burned up the whole world when the children of Israel failed God over and over again when they worshipped idols. There's something, uh, but why would God intervene in this event, Tower of Babel? So let's think about the times that God intervened, all right? One was uh, Genesis 1, God sent that universal flood, all right? Why? 
because of the sons of God, they were doing something. Why? Because sons of God are a huge threat. Hmm. But not just mankind, because mankind sin, when they sin, they just corrupt themselves. They're their own undoing. But when you contact and it has to affect the heavenlies, that's something big. Sons of God are capable of doing that. Mankind, not yet. So, Genesis 1, we get that. When does God intervene again? Not just the beginning, but the end as well, right? The end, at the tribulation, God intervenes, wipes them all out. Why? Because the sons of God, not just mankind's wickedness, sons of God come down and they interact with the humans. And then God's like, okay, that's my timing when I come down. Think about Noah's flood. Why did God intervene with the, universe, uh, with the worldwide flood? Because of what? Sons of God again. Think about uh, why God said, wipe out all the Canaanites and these inhabitants to the Jews. Why? Why, why, in the, why would God intervene that far? There were giants, sons of God again. Okay, then there's something here. If we look at scriptural evidence so far, when God intervenes, it has to do with the sons of God. If there is no sons of God thing over here, why would God intervene? It has to do with sons of God. Here's a big clue. It says, which they have imagined to do. What happens when mankind's imaginations carry far? They dabble not just science, they dabble with sons of God stuff. That's what happens with imagination. And you know that right now from seeing what's going on right now. But if you doubt me, go to Genesis 6. Go back to Genesis 6, why God intervened. And God had to stop mankind. Look at verse 5. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 through 4. Verse 1 through 4. And I'm not going to read it. You just read, you skim through it. Verse 1 through 4. God did not start out with mankind sinning. Did you notice that? He started out with what? Sons of God. They're the first one on his attention in this story of drowning out the world with the flood. It's the sons of God that got his attention. So that's the threat to God. It's those sons of God. That's the first thing on his mind, but what did God call that? What did God call, verse 1 through 4, uh, the sons of God interacting with humans. What do you call that? Verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that what? Every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. What did the Tower of Babel do? God says they're doing their imagination thing again. Why would God stop the Tower of Babel unless it's, it's reminding him of, man, this is Genesis 6 again. Their imagination. Mankind never learned. They're doing something with the sons of God. Here's something even more, more of a clue. All right? It's not just it has to do with the sons of God, interacting with the sons of God. It's liter more literal and biological than, than you think. Notice in all these cases that I point out where the Lord intervened, it has to do with man, mankind literally intermingling. Intermingling with the sons of God. All of it. All cases. So then could it have been possible with the Tower of Babel? That maybe the reason why they built such a high place to interact with the gods is so that something sexual can happen with those sons of God. Could that be possible? Why is it in your King James Bible, throughout Old Testament history, and the children of Israel always had idolatry in high places. There is what? Fornication. Sex. They don't just do that. They don't just come out of, all right, uh, you know, hey, we built a God. Let's all have sex. They don't do it like that. That's so weird. They learned it. Some, they learned something. There's a reason behind that. They learned it from their ancestors here. It has to do with sex intermingling with the sons of God. Why is sex so important for these idolaters, for high places? Why is that so important to them? Well, <laughs> do I have time? All right. 
I have some time, all right? All right, I'll give a little. All right, so the, 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 the kids can last longer in the room, right? Yeah. <laughs> all right, so I have a couple minutes. Um, you know what? Maybe I can cover all this one by one. Let's try to do it one by one, okay? Let's do this one by one, though, okay? I'm not going to cover all of it, but I'm going to cover some things one by one. Now, uh, the reason why is this. The, the greatest clue is go back to Genesis 6 again. Go back to Genesis 6 again, all right? Think about it. Why did the sons of God come down on the earth? What made them come down on the earth? What made them come down on the earth? What made them leave up here to come down on the earth? There was one reason. Verse 1, verse 1. Seducing women. Why do you think God made a big deal about seducing women then? Why do you think God hates it when women are, uh, are dressed up and act so seductively today? Why did God say at 1 Corinthians 11 about the women's protection? I think their hair, right? Why? They're covering. Covering? Covering what? There's something they're seducing. You see women go like this, you know? <laughs> it prevents the covering, perhaps, right? But then you notice right here, it's like to seduce. It causes, there's, there's one thing that's so funny. These sons of God have everything that they can trample humanity, but there is one weapon you humans have. That's seduction through women. Why? Those sons of God are male. They're not women. That's one thing humankind has that angels don't have. That's why I don't believe they're female angels. That's why I believe, yes, all angelic beings are men. Why else would they come down at Genesis 6? They, already, they could have had other women over there, but they didn't. So then they saw a woman down there. Think about it. Spiritual Superman that looks like a son of God almost is Samson. What was his weakness? Amen. He was invincible. But only a woman could t trample him down. If the Philistines saw that, if mankind saw that, mankind would know, oh, I know how to get them down. You use a seductive woman and put that in a high tower and have something sexual up there or a show or something pornographic. See that? All of this right now today it's connecting to something. We're seeing sexual imagery through what? Through our up in the air, through the phone and gum down. This is, uh, you're repeating, mankind is repeating Genesis. This is all intertwined. There's no doubt about this. So you put it up there, put on a show, and perhaps one of those sons of God can just open up that portal and just come down. That's how you can conjure them down. You might say, Really? We yeah, have Genesis chapter 6. Why did they come down? Because of verse 2, the daughters of men were fair. But God didn't blame those sons of God. You know who he blamed? Verse 5, mankind. Why? That was their imagination? That was mankind's imagination God attributed to. Mankind's imagination. Think about today, isn't it mankind's imagination to build something to reach up there? Mankind's imagination to interact with something spiritual or something heavenly? Isn't it mankind's imagination with all the sexual imagery? That's all man. So then, Genesis chapter 6, what do you think these people were doing? Well, I, re I remember my, back then my ancestors, how they were able to contact the gods. They had this seduction going on. They built these high places. There was something like this. Why don't we do the same thing too and conjure up a God to come down? And this is more disturbing and this is more convincing when you read Herodotus' The History, okay? So he's a, a secular historian from the pagan ancient times. And in his work, The Histories, he explains this about the tower's purpose, all right? He explained the tower's purpose is this. Listen. The temple is a square building, 
two furlongs each way with bronze gates and was still in existence in my time. It has a gold central tower, one furlong square with a second erected on top of it and then a third and so on up to eight. All eight towers can be climbed by a spiral way running round the outside and about halfway up there are seats and a shelter for those who make the ascent to rest on. On the summit, listen up, the summit of the topmost tower, on the top is what? Stands a great temple with a fine, large couch in it, richly covered and a golden table beside it. The shrine contains no image, no false god, no image. What? Why? And no one spends the night there except, as the Chaldeans who are the priests of Baal say, one Assyrian woman, all alone, whoever it may be that the God has chosen. The Chaldeans also say, though I do not believe them, that the God... Ent so it's amazing. He doesn't even believe them. Because what? This is something from ancient long ago he heard. He don't believe it, but I'll tell you what, God, God knows it. Those people believed it when they built that. So let me tell you. The Chaldeans also say, though I do not believe them, that the God enters the temple in person and takes his rest upon the bed. There's a similar story told by the Egyptians at Thebes where a woman always passes the night in the temple of the Theban Zeus and is forbidden, so they say, like the woman in the temple at Babylon, to have any intercourse with men. And there is yet another instance in the Lycian town of Patara, where the priestess who delivers the oracles when required is shut up in the temple during the night. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. That's why it's Nimrod and who? Semiramis. She was known to be a seductive beautiful woman. By the way, Assyrian, uh, this is all, they said Assyrian, Chaldean, Babylonian, and Egyptian. These are the four closest groups who had access to ancient times and knew about gods. That's phenomenal. That's why Jezebel was definitely a seductress. The Bible shows she tired her hair, she made herself look pretty before uh, Jehu threw her off the window. Obviously, that didn't work with Jehu, all right? So then, why does she do that? And she caused them to worship Baal and idolatry. Where did she learn all that from? Why did Revelation 2 teach that about her? It has to do with back then. That's how they had a seductive woman on a high elevation where you can contact the gods. That's where Jezebel learned it from, Semiramis and Nimrod. I got way more stuff, but I'm not going to tell you the stuff. All right, Paul even Paul Paul even warned about this possibly, oh, wow. about this. But next time, all right, next chance to study. All right, all right. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that today's teaching has been a blessing to the hearers and made us understand a lot about our history and about uh, today's patterns of mankind, no different from Genesis. And help us not to follow this wicked system. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.